got a little bit of time before we get started, but we will get started basically on time. Still got some people coming in. So firstly, just thanks so much for sticking around for this final session to today, for, of today for day two. I think maybe if I was in your position, I would have gone for an early beer, but that's just me. So thank you so much for sticking around and actually turning out uh, for this session in, in quite a good number. I, I really, really, really do appreciate it. I don't want to sound too biased, but I do think you have made an excellent choice. Um, and I hope that you do not live to regret that decision, but we are this close to some beer. So if it is a disaster, well, then we can just kill some brain cells and forget about it almost immediately. All right. So um, a quick intro. My name's Adele Carpenter and I am a software engineer at Trifork Amsterdam. Most of my day I do spend building and maintaining Java and Kotlin applications for the educational sector. Although more and more you will find me trying not to cause too much damage with React in the front end. Now, as the title of this talk suggests, this is part two of a topic I have spoken about before. So has anyone seen part one of this talk, either in person or online? We have one. I was not expecting. Excellent. Thanks so much. Uh, so that's really, really cool. Welcome back. And if you haven't seen it, like absolutely no worries at all. Uh, part one and part two are completely uh, standalone. So you won't be paying uh, catch up at all. And while I am really proud of part one of this talk, uh, part one of this talk, perhaps I was a little bit too ruthless in the detail I left out of it in order to tell a nice story in a digestible way. So I'm going to revisit that choice and provide a little bit more context to the history of civil aviation uh, and the study of aviation disasters. And of course, what we can glean from that as software professionals. So First up, a, a little overview of the first 50 or so years of aviation. That always boggles my mind. 120 years ago, we were simple ground dwellers. And now, well, we are simple ground dwellers with flying machines. Now, I don't want to spend too long on this at all, so buckle up as I am going to keep the pace high. So here is a bare bone times line uh, from 1903 to 1950 or so. So let me walk you through it. So aviation, as we know, it started with the Wright brothers in 1903 with the first man-controlled flights. Just over 10 years later, when World War I rolled around, developments accelerated to match the new technology to the requirements of the battlefield. Between World War I and II, there was space for a bit of fun as we saw the first airlines, daily passenger routes, air shows and transoceanic flights. But when the fun stopped again with World War II, developments in aviation kept accelerating. Most of the developments were around air-based weaponry, but we did see more general improvements, such as improvements in manufacturing and the development of the jet engine. After the war, humanity had the space again to focus on commercial aviation and we saw air traffic grow by about 20% per year. So by the time that we get to this point in the late 1940s, we have a paradigm shifting technology whose early development was catalyzed by not one, but two world wars. Um, this was then followed by a rapid period of a growth and adoption in the civilian sector. So what do you think is going to happen? That's right, disaster. All right, my clicker's on the fritz, I'm sorry. Oh, here we go. All right. So here is a summary of the causal factors of plane crashes from 1950 until to 2019. I got this from a table called planecrashinfo.com. I debated whether or not to recreate this table in a more aesthetic and less grainy way, but actually <laughs> I kind of love it. I know it looks like it hasn't been updated since 1996, but the website is actively administered and the latest crash is actually in the database is actually from just a couple of weeks ago. Now, aviation geeks are really not that different from dev geeks. We, the dev geeks, might have the slicker online tools, but the level of detail, care, precision and obsession is the same on both sides. The Venn diagram of both communities is basically a circle. 
And a quick note before we do dive into the numbers, be aware this does cover fatal crashes only where at least two people have died. And it also only looks at civil, civilian aviation or civil aviation, uh, military aviation is not included. So now that you've had a bit of time to digest it, even with me up here making bad jokes, I hope that one thing has leapt out to you already. And that is that over the decades, the most common cause of fatal air crashes is pilot error. You may have also noticed that the breakdown by these four broad causes is relatively consistent although that we can see that mechanical causes have reduced since the 1950s and 60s. But worryingly, if we look a little bit closer, we might want to infer a jump in the number of crashes caused by pilot error in the 2010s. Later, we'll discuss a case study that points as to why or hints as to why. But for now, I want to take a look at the number of crashes. Because if we look at the actual numbers rather than the percentages, it actually tells a different and more hopeful story. Again, with the beautiful formatting courtesy of the source website. So here we can see a peak of crashes in the 1970s with 230, with pretty remarkable attenuation after that, dropping every decade until the 2010s, until we are left with 49 fatal crashes and 28 of them due to pilot error. Now, please bear with me for another 30 seconds as we do paint the final bit of the picture. We can see here the global fatalities per million passengers consistently dropping for decades. We're now hovering at around one death per 10 million passengers. Now, climate issues aside, aviation is an incredibly safe mode of travel and it's only tended, trended towards safer, uh, an engineering success story that I think that we can learn from. And one thing that I do really appreciate about the aviation industry is the deep understanding that is rarely one cause for something. If you read the final air crash investigation reports, and trust me, I have read more than I care to remember, you will find that there is typically a list of causal factors as well as contributing factors for a crash. Disaster is not just something that spontaneously happens. Often many systems, people, process or mechanical have had to break down. So with that in mind, there was one big change in the late 1970s and early 80s that did drastically reduce the number of crashes attributable to pilot error. And that was the expedited introduction of crew resource management after the United Airways crash uh, flight, sorry, of 173 in 1978. Now, I do cover this crash in more detail in part one of this talk. You can check it out on YouTube if you're interested. I actually have a highly Googleable name, which is nice. So while working on resolving uh, an issue with the landing gear, the captain was unaware that the plane was running out of fuel. A causal factor of this crash was a breakdown of communication in the cockpit. The captain didn't ask, nor did the co-pilots assertively communicate the severity of the fuel situation. In the end, they did run out of fuel and 10 people lost their lives. So crew resource management teaches airline crew how to make effective use of the resources available to them to ensure a safe and, uh, ensure the, a safe and efficient flight. So this includes equipment, procedures and people, both inside and outside of the cockpit. And originally it was just introduced for pilots, but now it is an important part of training uh, for cabin and ground crew as well. And this has really been a big driver in the reduction of crashes related to pilot error. Now, in the 2000s, we saw another drop in crashes attributable to pilot error as CRM, so crew resource management, not content relationship management, anyway, uh, was uh, expanded to uh, emerging aviation markets. 
So the 1990s and 2000s also saw the wider adoption of fly-by-wire technology and flying automation accompanied by enhanced warning protections and systems. Uh, so if you consider this in the context of continuous improvements to maintenance procedures, training and regulatory oversight, this really led to a, big, a period of big leaps in aviation safety. Even crashes due to the weather dropped in this period as airports and crews gained access to better meteorological data and training and the aircraft were fitted with advanced features like wind shear detection systems. And if you don't know already, wind shear is the pants browning experience of a sudden change in wind direction. You can imagine that if you are close to the ground and you get a sudden gust of wind downward, just how dangerous that could be. The widespread introduction of airborne wind shear detection and alert systems was a key recommendation after the crashes of Pan Am Flight 759 in 1982 and Delta Airlines Flight 191 in 1985. In this respect, these crashes were instrumental in advancing weather-related safety in aviation. And while it certainly is true that technical advancements have been a significant driver of improving aviation safety, it would be remiss of me to gloss over the fact that this has brought with it significant challenges. And I think the discussion and appreciation of these challenges is where the real gnarly insights for software professionals lie. So fly-by-wire and its related systems has really opened, a lot, opened the door to a lot of questions surrounding the pilot's role in flying the aircraft and the limitations of humans when it comes to understanding and interacting with automation. Fly-by-wire was first deployed with the F-16 in 1974. Traditionally, fixed-wing aircraft are controlled by a control column called a yoke, and this uh, yoke is uh, mechanically connected to the surfaces of the aircraft. So when the pilot pulls the yoke back, this is a direct input on a cable which moves the elevator up, driving the tail down and therefore the nose up. And the key point here is that there is a cable or rod running from the cockpit to the tail and the other control surfaces. In fly-by-wire, the flight control computer accepts pilot input to the controls and manipulates the control surface in such a way so as to produce the pilot's desired result. So essentially, the flight computer acts as a middleman for the pilot's instructions, a much lighter, smarter and opinionated middleman than traditional cables and rods where it delivers instructions by wire. Now, this middleman can and does provide protections to ensure that the aircraft stays within its safe flight parameters. So if the pilot is trying to pitch the nose so far up that the plane will lose lift and enter a stall, the computer will be like, nah, I don't reckon, and make a much smaller adjustment to the flight control surfaces. In the words of the F-16 pilots, you don't fly an F-16, it flies you. So moving back to the commercial realm, 1988 saw the launch of the Airbus A320, which was the first airliner with fully, dig fully digital fly-by-wire controls. It was also a key moment in what has become somewhat diverging philosophies of Airbus and Boeing with respect to automation. Airbus's stance is that automation should allow the pilot to use the uh, safe flight envelope to its full extent. The flight envelope is basically the safe operating limits of the aircraft, although this can vary based on weight, speed and altitude, amongst other things. So at a certain weight and speed, for example, there is a safe range of altitude. It's also where the saying pushing the envelope comes from to mean pushing the limits of a situation. So the flight computers on Airbus um, aircraft follow a series of laws that each offer various levels of protection. 
And a protection is basically a nah, I don't reckon, response from the flight computer. And these laws are called normal, alternate and direct law. In normal law, you have the most uh, protections and in direct, you have the least. Uh, and I think it's a very telling design decision from Airbus that it is not possible for the pilot to decide uh, which law they want to operate under. And this is always determined by the aircraft. The only way I could explain this is to say that Airbus takes a computer-centric approach. Boeing, on the other hand, has traditionally taken a much more pilot-centric approach. They did in 1994 introduce the 777, which is fly-by-wire, and later the 787 or Dreamliner. However, their highest selling aircraft, the 737, decidedly has mechanical controls. And a quick nod to the elephant in the room, because we have seen some deviation from that approach with the introduction of MCAS with the 737 MAX 8. But it's a little bit of a special case and it is worthy of its own talk. And you're in luck because actually there is a talk about the MAX 8 by a man called Kyle Kotoic. Sorry, Kyle, if I said that wrong. Uh, I saw it a couple of days ago and I do highly recommend it. Uh, he's been giving it for a little while, so you should be able to find it online. In any case, I am not in a position to make any claim about which philosophy is better, pilot-centric or computer-centric, if one is at all. However, I do find the fact that the two largest aircraft manufacturers, despite traditionally putting the same priority on aviation safety, have taken two different approaches to achieving it. Indeed, what are the appropriate roles of human and machine when it comes to machine-assisted decision-making? We are facing this question right now with the introduction of AI assistance tools like ChatGPT and Copilot. And there is one crash that I think sums this up really well, and I'll share it with you now in a storytelling format. I do warn you, it's quite heavy and it is relatively recent. It may be that some of you did have friends or family on the flight, so if you would like to excuse yourself, that's totally understandable. So the flight is Air France 447, which crashed into the Atlantic Ocean on June 1st, 2009 as it was returning uh, to Paris from Rio de Janeiro. So I will give you a minute if anyone wants to leave the room while I take a sip of water. Uh, we, no, I think we're good. All right. So I will still take that sip of water though. So please prepare your eyes a little bit because we are about to hit dark mode. Okay. <clears throat> so it's June 1st, 2009. Air France First Officers Daniel Robert and Pierre Cédric Bonin are in the cockpit of the Airbus A330 over the mid-Atlantic Ocean. Bonin, the less experienced of the two pilots, is the pilot flying in the right-hand seat. Robert is the pilot not flying in the left-hand seat, the captain's seat. Wait, where's the captain, you might wonder. Well, as this is a 14-hour flight from Rio to Paris, the allowed duty time of 10 hours will be exceeded. In order to complete the flight and manage the fatigue of the crew, the three pilots rotate so that each of them can get some rest and remain alert while in the cockpit. Captain Dubois has just stepped out for his rest. Nothing out of the ordinary. However, Bonin is feeling a little uneasy. He is flying through the intertropical convergence zone in June. As is common at this time of the year, he is experiencing some light turbulence as he flies through a layer of cloud. He had discussed the weather uh, with the captain just before Dubois took his rest. He'd proposed a couple of small adjustments that they could make to the flight path to potentially avoid the worst of it. But Captain Dubois was not com uh, particularly concerned and the proposed adjustments also carry some risk. 
Bonin and Robert notice some ice crystals in the cloud light layer and turn on the anti-icing system. Less than three minutes later, an alarm sounds. The autopilot has disconnected. I have the controls, says Bonin. Robert confirms. The plane rolls from side to side a little as Bonin settles into flying the plane manually. He pitches the nose up. We haven't got a good indication of speed, he says. The autopilot has disengaged because the flight computer can't make sense of the conflicting airspeed data it is getting. The data is bad because the airspeed sensors are clogged with ice crystals. Alternate law, protection's low, says Robert. In alternate law, there is still some support from the flight computer, but critically, no anti-stall protection. Not long after Bonin takes the controls, the stall warning sounds. The stall warning is designed to be as intrusive as possible. So think of the loudest crickets you have ever heard and multiply it by 10. And that's on top of a continuous C chord master warning as well as multiple visual alerts. It's pure sensory overload. Robert adds to what must be overwhelming noise in the cockpit. Watch your speed. Watch your speed. Okay, okay, I'm going back down, replies Bonin. According to all three, you're going up, so go back down. Bonin reduces his nose up input and thrust, and the stall warning temporarily stops, although there are still other multiple warnings demanding their attention. The pilots have control of the aeroplane again, yet confusion remains. Unbeknownst to them, the airspeed sensors are now ice-free and all of the avionics are functioning normally again, although there is still some curious behaviour from some instruments. They still don't have a full grasp on the situation. Robert focuses his attention on summoning the captain. Damn it, where is he? The stall warning starts again. I'm in toga, right? Says Bonin. Toga is short for take off, go around. This setting provides the maximum thrust needed for the plane to take off with the nose pitched up. It is designed to be applied at lower altitude where the air is heavier. This statement hints that Bonin has, to quote the investigation report directly, built an erroneous representation of the aeroplane's flight model. The fact that his actions are not resolving the warning deepens his mistrust of what the aeroplane is telling him. He may be further emboldened by the fact that the A330 carries robust anti-stall features. Anti-stall features that are not available to him in the current flight computer mode of alternate law. I don't have control of the aeroplane anymore now, exclaims Bumnin. Controls to the left, asserts Robert. Eight seconds later, Captain Dubois enters and takes a seat behind Robert and Bonin. What are you doing? What's happening? I don't know what's happening, says Robert. We're losing control of the aeroplane, confirms Bonin. Over the next two and a half minutes, the three pilots try to understand and resolve their situation. Captain Dubois recognises that they are in a stall and Robert pushes the nose down to try and gain airflow over the wings. More airflow, more lift. But they cannot re uh, gain, regain control of the aeroplane. When they get dangerously close to the sea, Robert reverses inputs by pulling back and says, climb, 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 climb. Chillingly, Bonin responds, but I've been nose up for a while. Captain Dubois pleads, no, 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 don't climb. Give the controls to me, give the controls to me, says Robert. Go ahead, you have the controls. We're still in toga, yeah, replies Bonin. Robert spends the next 35 seconds trying to recover the aeroplane, but it is far too late. Moments later, Bonin exclaims, we're going to crash, this can't be true. And the cockpit recording ends along with 228 lives. I've read the transcript of this flight many times and it still sends a chill down my spine every time that I read it. I actually feel a bit now. Um, for obvious reasons, the real recording has not been released to the public, but I can just imagine the investigators sitting there just dumbfounded uh, with what they're listening to. And it's easy to blame the pilots for this crash and many people have, including the UK press 
and the courts. Um, and to say that they are not at all responsible for the crash would also be incorrect. But as someone who did not lose a loved one in this uh, disaster, I do have the luxury of being able to avoid the blame game and instead focusing on what we can learn. And also, do you see here in the subtitle the implication that the pilots were shirking their responsibilities and sleeping on the job? Asleep mandated by safety requirements? Classic tabloid journalism. Anyway, I do digress. Air France 447 highlights something that I don't think that we think about enough as software professionals, and that is how humans interact with complex systems, particularly those with a lot of redundancy. There is a tendency to think that outside of cost considerations, more redundancy is better and in safety critical systems in particular, you're willing to take on those extra costs in order to have that extra safety or fallback. Even in non-safety critical systems, there is a level of expected redundancy, the classic examples being backups and having your application running in multiple regions or data centers, or running your database or message broker as a cluster. Indeed, in my team at Trifork, we run our own cluster of three nodes of our message broker, RabbitMQ. Three, of course, being the magical minimum number for redundancy. And recently, we encountered an issue that caught us a bit by surprise and resulted in eight minutes of downtime of our main application during a busy period. So just like you would see in the cockpit, we started receiving alerts about an unexpected state. We had a growing number of messages uh, in two of our production message queues, in addition to disks that were getting dangerously full. The number of messages in these queues was around 600,000 each, which was high, but not unexpected during a busy time. However, rapidly shrinking disk space was concerning and our message th throughput was low. We decided that a low risk first course of action would be to restart one of the affected applications listening on one of the queues. Unfortunately, that did not resolve the issue. And after some back and forth in the team and with the disk getting ever more full, we decided to take the secondary RabbitMQ server offline and bring it back with extended disk space. At first, it seemed to go well. We took the node offline without a problem and the application was still limping along, serving requests with fewer nodes. But there was a key part of this redundancy model that we didn't understand. Because the queues were still very large, in total over a million messages, when we reattached the node to the cluster, the node started to sync itself with the queue, basically stopping time while it copied one million messages. And all we could do was wait. During what felt like the longest eight minutes of my life, no messages could be consumed at all. And as such, our main application was unavailable to our users. Now, this is not a perfect example, but it shows the perils of interacting with complexity and redundancy under pressure. Probably someone on the team should have known about the sync time on such a big queue. One guy over there was nodding emphatically. But one set up, we needed you that day. But one set up, the queue just kind of works. Now, back to the Airbus. Here is a schematic of the systems involved in providing aerodynamic and inertial parameter data to the pilots on the A330. ADARU is short for Air Data Inertial Reference Unit. You might recall the first part of the Air France 447 story, the autopilot disconnected due to conflicting airspeed data. The air data part of the ADARU is most notably responsible for the calibrated airspeed and Mach data to the pilots, so providing that data to the pilots. Now, if you're thinking, wait, isn't Mach speed as well? Well, you're right. Mach is presented as a fraction of the speed of sound, whereas calibrated airspeed is presented in knots. Now, oversimplifying here, but above about 28,000 feet, Mach typically becomes the more important measure of airspeed. 
Now, the inertial part of the ADRU provides data such as ground speed and attitude or pitch. So the number of degrees that the nose is pitched up and down relative to the ground. So you can see here on the left and the right side, the physical sensors that provide the data to the ADRUs. And without getting too bogged down in specifics, airspeed data is calculated from static and total air pressure. And there are six static air pressure sensors on an A330. Uh, the total pressure is measured by something called a pitot tube, which is a small tube that sticks out the side of the fuselage. The A330 has three pitot tubes circled in green here. And you can see here that the data from PITO-1 feeds the captain's flight display, uh, PITO-2 feeds the co-pilots, and PITO-3 feeds the standby pilot's flight display. You can also see something here called ISIS, unfortunate name I know, which is the Integrated Standby Instrument System. Now, this is designed to serve as a backup in case of failure of the standard flight displays. So forget turtles, it's redundancies all the way down. So we have redundancy of data, given that we have multiple sensors measuring the same thing. And we have static redundancy of the three ADRUs, where an error in one system can be outvoted by the other two systems. Then we have redundancy on top of these three uh, flight display systems with an external computer system that integrates the information from a variety of sources. Now, if you're feeling overwhelmed, confused, unsure, or simply bored right now, two people already just left, then you understand the point that I am trying to make. Redundant systems do not operate in isolation. When they work, they're great. When they fail, they fail hard in unexpected ways. And often what you'll find at the other end are some humans under immense pressure to not only try and figure out what is happening, but also to save the day. In the case of Air France 447, the cascade of unfortunate events started with a loss of reliable airspeed information due to the pitot tubes icing over in the absence of the captain. The autopilot could not make sense of the conflicting airspeed data it was getting, so it disconnected. Let the humans figure it out. The aeroplane displayed an abundance of alerts and messages to the co-pilots who had not encountered the situation before, not even in the simulator. To make matters worse, many of these messages were about the consequences of the problem rather than the origin of the problem. And unable to make sense of what was being presented to them, the pilots failed to diagnose the situation correctly and apply the appropriate checklist. Under stress, possibly suffering from the startle effect and possibly reacting to the intermittent appearance of the crossbars on his display, Bo Nin pitched the nose up. He had little practice flying the plane manually at altitude and was used to the A330's anti-stall protections. But the anti-stall protection was gone once the flight computer shifted to alternate law, a fact that Bonin was expected to remember within seconds. Tragically, the attempts of Robert to push the nose down to gain speed and recover the stall proved futile. Due to the design of the cockpit and the controls and the fact that it was dark, Robert could not see Bonin's side stick and see that it was being pulled back. So the conflicting input of the pilots, one nose up and one nose down, effectively cancelled each other out, adding even more confusion to the situation. Now, when Bonin finally exclaims, but I've been nose up for a while, the penny dropped, but it was too late. Now, Air France 447 is basically the poster child for automation gone wrong, and the media certainly had a field day with this narrative. 
But the more interesting and less tabloid worth, tabloid worthy discussion for me is how do we design more human centric systems in a digital world? Now, not just for ourselves, uh, not for, just for users, sorry, but for ourselves as developers. Because I really dislike the approach of, oh, well, if the unexpected happens, say, I don't know, and hand it back to the users. Maybe you can get by with this with simple systems, but as the system gets more complex, then you're actually demanding a lot from your users. So at best, the user gets annoyed, but does in fact try again later. And at worst, you have a plane falling out of the sky. Somewhere in the middle, there's me holding my breath for eight minutes while a node syncs a queue of a million messages while it reconnects to the cluster. Somewhere next to me, there's you having a mini meltdown because your, sta your slack is blowing up and your exquisite dashboards have disintegrated into an amber and red mess. And in this corner, there's Pete having a great time with his headphones on and his alerts muted because the alerts don't usually mean anything anyway. Now, in order to start thinking about human-centric design, you've got to understand some simple features of humanity, or depending on who you ask, bugs of humanity. And aviation has encountered most of them. So first, we have a limited working memory. So are you already familiar with the concept of cognitive load? Patricia G touched on it this morning. So a few nods, yeah. So just quickly, cognitive load refers to how much of our working memory is required for a task. You may have heard that our working memory can hold five to nine uh, chunks of novel information. But the number that shocked me is that about only two to four of those chunks can actually be worked on or thought about at once. The cool part, though, is that this limit applies to novel information only, not information already stored in long-term memory. So for pilots, this highlights even further the importance of relevant training and experience to free up as much working memory as possible for truly novel information. And as developers, we can strive to make the way people interact with our systems as consistent as possible. The consistency over correctness is not a dead concept. So Copa Airlines Flight 201 highlights the importance of consistency in human-centric design even further. In 1992, a Boeing 737 crapped, <laughs> crapped, <laughs> crashed in Darien Gap, a region of almost impenetrable jungle in Panama. And despite the immense challenges of the terrain, inve investigators were able to piece together the flight data recorder and collect the bulk of the wreckage. Now, a key piece of the puzzle is the data from the captain's vertical gyro. The gyro is the data source for the attitude indicator shown here, which is the instrument I think most people recognize and can associate with flying. This one here is similar to the one on COPA 201. It shows the plane in relation to the horizon and it's very difficult to fly without it. And given that it's so critical, some smart engineers built some redundancy in. So similar to the airspeed that we saw in the A330, there is a gyro uh, on the captain's side that feeds the captain's display and one on the right side to feed the co-pilot's display. And there's also an auxiliary gyro that feeds a standby display. And if you identify an issue with one of the gyros, for example, the captain's gyro, then there's a switch where you can set the data source for both displays to be the co-pilot's gyro. Now, similar to what we saw with Air France 447, Flight 201 starts receiving bad data, which causes the uh, autopilot to disconnect. This time, the faulty data source is the captain's gyro. 
So in the dark, the pilots need to manage flying the plane with a broken attitude indicator. And the investigators can only be shocked as the flight data recorder, uh, recorder yep, tells a terrifying story of the pilots repeatedly reacting to the bad data until they eventually roll the plane out of the sky. Why didn't they just switch the data source? I'll have a sip of water while you look at that. So here is how the switch appeared when it was pulled from the wreckage. It says both on VG or vertical gyro one. This means that the pilots had identified they were getting bad data, but then pointed both displays to the bad data source. Like what were they thinking? Now, let me show you the same switch installed in the simulator in which the pilots were trained on. So putting aside the fact that this is a different style of switch altogether, in the simulator, left means give the captain auxiliary data. And in the plane that crashed, left means switch the co-pilot to the captain's bad data source. So this is deadly UX if you're ever going to see it. And it's about the most extreme example you can get of consistency over correctness. So moving on to the second bug of humanity, which is that we have a blind spot for our assumptions. In 1989, British Midlands Flight 92 crashed while attempting an emergency landing. The first, sub tri the first sign of trouble in the cockpit was a loud pounding noise and a severe vibration. In the cabin, smoke poured in and some sp passengers could see sparks coming from the left engine. Whilst the pilots were very experienced on this aircraft type in the 737, they only had 76 hours combined on this version, the 737-400. And in previous versions of the 737, the right air conditioning uh, system receives what's called bleed air from the right engine as it supplies air to the cabin. And then the left does the same for the cockpit. However, on the new version of this aircraft, the air is actually from the left and the right is actually mixed. Now, the captain, relying on his experience, sensed the smoke coming forward from the cabin and assumed the problem was with the right engine. Based on this shared assumption, he and the co-pilot power down the engine on the right. Unfortunately, as bad luck would have it, at that same moment, the auto throttle disengaged, reducing the fuel flow to the left engine. As a result, the fire weakened and the smell of smoke subsided, which seemed to confirm to the pilots that they had taken the right course of action. But when they start the approach uh, for the emergency landing, they increase the thrust, growing the fire to an extent that it kills the damaged left engine entirely. And by this point, they are traveling far too slowly to restart the good engine, and they crash right next to the motorway. So, on to the third bug of humanity up for discussion today. We do irrational things. Despite heavy protests to the contrary, rational people do irrational things. Yes, even developers, and yes, especially users. So British Midlands was one of two crashes in Britain in the 80s that were pivotal in improving the survival rate of survivable crashes. And no, not because everyone got a lecture on verifying their assumptions before acting, although that would be very useful for most people. Of the 126 passengers and crew on board Midlands Flight 92, 79 people survived, with 74 of them suffering in injuries. By examining the injuries and the aircraft, a number of recommendations were made in relating to the aircraft itself, such as improvements to seat floor and overhead bin design. 
There were also changes made to the recommended brace position and the restraints of young children. However, the survivors of the Midlands crash had already benefited from the 1985 Manchester Airport disaster only four years earlier. In this crash, an engine failure during takeoff generated a fire. The takeoff was aborted and the captain ordered an evacuation. Of the 137 passengers and crew, 55 died, mostly from smoke inhalation, as they attempted to rush, climb, fight and squeeze their way to the emergency exits. The Manchester airport disaster forced aircraft manufacturers to consider the behaviour of a group of humans facing death, behaviour which in most other contexts would be completely irrational. These changes included things you're hopefully familiar with, such as the strip lighting in the aisles directing you towards an exit, removing a seat at the overwind exits, and widening the entry of the galley to create more space for exiting the aircraft, fire suppression systems in the cabin, the use of less flammable materials for things like seat cushions and carpets. So only a couple of small changes. For the airlines, the changes included spreading crew of different experience levels throughout the cabin and a pre-flight safety briefing of passengers sitting in the exit row. On a more individual level, irrational choices are often driven by bias, emotion and stress. In the final report of Air France 447, investigators mentioned that the crew acted irrationally in response to the anti-stall warning, probably due to the startle effect. Ongoing training is often repetitive and well known to the crews, blunting their ability to truly react in a measured way to the unexpected. A developer parallel for that, I guess, might be something like game days. But I think the bigger point here is the role of stress in your user's behavior. So have a think about the stress your users could be experiencing. For example, noisy environments or a poor internet connection. How can you make it easier for them to interact with your application under these circumstances? The last bug slash feature of humanity I'd like to mention today is simply that we get used to things. As was the case with Pete and his muted alerts, repeat applications of a stimulus tend to result in a decreased response. In psychology, this is called habituation. So if the alerting is too eager, eventually you'll just start to ignore the alerts, putting you in the same position as if you had no alerts. And another manifestation of getting used to things is simply going through the motions. Even if something does have a high risk of going wrong, if you do it enough, you can become complacent. So in 1988, Delta Airlines Flight 1141 crashed shortly after takeoff because the flaps were not deployed. So these things here. So as you can see, the flaps extend out the back of the wing during takeoff and landing. And what they do is they increase the surface area of the wing so that it can generate more lift while the plane is traveling more slowly. It's a pretty crucial part of the takeoff procedure. In the cockpit voice recording, the pilots can be heard chatting while going through the pre-flight checklist. While the pilots both announce the deployment of the flaps, the sound of the flap lever is not audible in the recording. Examination of the wreckage confirmed this finding. However, the pilots who had survived were in pure disbelief. They were certain they had deployed the flaps. The absolute kicker in this case is that the aircraft, a Boeing 727, did have a takeoff warning system installed. This system provides an audible warning to the pilots if the aircraft is not appropriately configured for takeoff. It literally yells at you if you try to take off without the flaps deployed. In this case, the switch that operated the takeoff warning system had been modified to prevent useless activations during aircraft taxiing. So we are going to run a couple of minutes over time, but not too long. <laughs> 
We're not going to be, we, we'll get you beer, don't worry. So three, four minutes. So before we do wrap up, I do have a confession to make. I know I did promise you a discussion of project failures and wrong incentives. And if I'm honest, when I promised you that, I had a particular story in mind. Now, do imagine my disappointment when I find out that it isn't true. Now, this is the de Havilland Comet 1, the world's first commercial passenger jet. If you ask the internet why are aeroplane windows round, you will generally be met with a statement along the lines of, well, we tried it with the comet and it crashed because the stress at the corners of the square's windows. So let's zoom in here a little bit so you can get a look. Yeah, it's pixelated, that's okay. That's what happens when you try to get photos from the 50s. I'm doing my best. All right. So the story does get better because it was apparently the manager that suggested that the windows should be square so as to separate air travel from the round portholes of sea travel. You know, so we get this lovely legend that because the ego-driven manager said so and with incentives in place that favoured not rocking the boat over prioritising safety, we got square windows and disaster. All entirely believable and relatable, but all mostly untrue, unfortunately. The comet, unfortunately, did suffer from structural fatigue issues in the fuselage, but as we've already covered today, there is rarely one reason for failure, and this case is no different. But if you did have to pick a choice zero, for so to speak, it was the decision to use a specific type of engine, which turned out to be incredibly underpowered. And this required an ultralight fuselage, which proved susceptible to structural fatigue, which was just a concept we didn't understand that well at the time. So now we're at the point where I make some closing remarks and put what I've said today in a neat little package, in a part where I give you a list of takeaways where you can take a picture of. But before I do that, I want to acknowledge that I've probably given you more questions than answers, and that's totally fine by me. So I want you to take this list of takeaways with a grain of salt, because if there's something else that resonated with you, take that and run with it. And if you see me at the conference tomorrow or at the party tonight, I would love to hear your take. But for now, here is what I hope you got out of the session. First, rapid adoption of a new technology will always have problems, but it's the way that we approach these problems that matters. As a technology matures, the human element becomes even more important. Focus shifts from making the technology better to understanding the users better. More redundancy is not always better. It's important to weigh the extra safety and reliability of the system itself with the cognitive load put on users to understand and interact with the system. Users is a wider definition than you think. Start thinking of yourself as a user of the system that you build and maintain and see where that gets you. Lastly, the humans that interact with your system have significantly shortcomings simply because we are human. Learn to work with it and not against it. So my name is Adele and thank you so much for your time. Uh, the QR code for the slides is there. Uh, we are over time, but I am so happy to chat with you at the party or tomorrow. Uh, I'll be here all day. So for now, enjoy your evening.